off to a fantastic start at Chinese Institute. The rats meant to bring lots of good things as long as you don't find them in the subway system in New York. I just wanted to say a, a quick shout out before we get started to some of our trustees that are here tonight. I saw some of them floating around. In my front is our secretary, Ingrid Ehrenberg, thank you, and Joe, Sophia Shung, and Yvonne here. Yvonne is here too. Thank you so much for coming. As I said, there's so much going on at Chinese Institute. We have tons of things going on for Chinese New Year. On February 3rd, we've got our annual gala, which is going to be amazing. Totally great food, totally great entertainment, line dances and stuff. You can sign up on our website. Sunday, we also have activities for the whole family for Chinese New Year activities. And before I close out, a big thank you for everybody for putting up with this space. Very, very soon. We're not going to be sitting in a hallway anymore. We're just moving out construction. You can hear the banging and stop for our 5,000, almost 6,000 square feet of new space that's coming on board behind us. So we'll be able to have a proper reading space for about 300 people coming up very, very soon. And downstairs, we're also building out. So thank you for while we put up with our, with our building. Um, you didn't come to listen to me. You came for what's a really, really exciting program. I'm so looking forward to listening to what these two women have to come to share with us this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to pass over the evening now to Dinda Elliott, who's our senior vice president, who runs all the programming here, to tell us a little bit more about what we have in store for this evening. Thank you. by saying that we're following Chatham House rules tonight. And what that means is that you, it's a kind of a complicated thing. You can use the information, but you cannot reveal the, the identity of speakers. So you can say there was a conversation about blah, blah, blah. But you cannot talk about who the speakers were. So it's, essentially it means it's off the record, OK? And what that means is no WeChat posts, OK? I'm just being really clear, no WeChat posts. No quotes on social media. Photos are OK. Right? Photos are OK. So we are so honored uh, to have these two strong and awesome women on stage here at China Institute. Um, Yenlan, as you, as you know, uh, Yenlan and Mei Yan are two of the most influential business women in China. Yenlan heads Lazard's operations in Greater China. And Mei Yan oversees Brunswick Group's advisory work in China. Both are what I call communist royalty. Um, and what I mean by that is in the sense that they come from very prominent families, very important families. And um, that, what that also means is that, is that they both experienced firsthand uh, the turmoil of communist China's history at the, right at the political center. Uh, so Yen's father was Chairman Mao's Russian translator. And her grandfather was a communist informant during the Civil War. So very important um, family. And when the Cultural Revolution swept the country, they were both imprisoned. And her mother was forced out of Beijing, leaving a 10-year-old Yen to survive on her own in Beijing. Mei is the daughter of China's one-time propaganda czar, uh, who was also a prisoner during the Cultural Revolution. Lucky for us, Yen has written an amazing memoir uh, which details her family's experiences and hardship in riveting detail. I have read every word of the book, and I will tell you, you've got it is. We have copies on sale tonight, and Yen has uh, Yen Lan has very um, gen graciously agreed to sign copies at the end, and I really recommend it. You should, all should read it. So, so Lan, let's let's hand it over to you first. Um, Lan is going to walk us through, take 10 minutes or so, and walk us through some slides of her family and her life, and after that we'll have a conversation. And um, I'm going to keep track of time because I want to make sure that we have time for a really great conversation afterwards. But go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. I hope the clicker works. I don't know if you can see Can you all see if you can? Yeah. Oops. Uh-oh. So I just walk through a few photos and give you visual yeah. Okay. 
let's see. So, um, my book, The House of Yen, is about uh, my family story of three generations. My grandfather, my parents, and myself through 100 year Chinese modern history. My grandfather, Yan Mohan, was born 1895, one year after the first Sino Japanese war. And uh, he was born from a, a poor peasant's family. He managed to go to school. After the college, he decided to set up the charity schools in Haicheng, in Shenyang. Uh, oh, sorry. For the people, <laughs> the people, uh, for the children came from the poor family. In 1927, uh, he got a scholarship and to go to uh, Edinburgh University for study social conditions of workers at that time. Two years later, he came back from Europe to Shenyang because at that time, the northeast um, China situation was uh, chaotic and uh, the Japanese intention to invade uh, northeast China was um, obvious. And then Japanese started attack Shenyang on, um, everyone knows this event, September 18, 1931. So uh, very soon they took uh, three provinces, they took over three provinces of northeast and set up a puppet uh, regime of Manzhou War for 14 years. My grandfather involved at that time in anti-Japanese movement as a leader. And then he moved to Nanjing, uh, joined Jiangping Shui, worked with him. And this is a family photo of all his family. Uh, my, grandfa uh, my grandfather with his um, six children, and uh, my father was the youngest one. My cousin is here, <laughs> her mother is uh, the fifth one, right? So I'm so happy to have my cousin here since years. I didn't see her. And uh, so in uh, 1937, uh, in uh, 19, uh, Yan Baohang met Zhou Enlai, who convinced him to join the Communist Party because uh, Zhou Enlai said the Communist Party is really had a determination to fight against, against the Japanese. So my grandfather joined the Communist Party and became secret agent, as Buddha said, for the Second World War and got a few important information, including uh, the Operation Pamarosa timing of German attack Soviet Union. So, and uh, in um, 1949, it's precise exactly the 22nd June. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> the uh, after New China set up by the communist government, my grandfather worked under Jun Lai's leadership, first in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then um, at um, a China Political Consultative uh, Conference, the Chinese Senate. My father studied uh, Russian at the age of uh, 16 and became Mao Zedong's personal interpreter during the 1950s and 1960s. Married my mom and uh, she came from a bourgeois family and uh, uh, her father came to US in to, uh, uh, 1922, study at MIT first, and then Junior Music School for violin. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a diplomat, speak uh, French, English, and self-taught Italian. She told me she was not the best Italian uh, interpreter during the 1950s, but she was the first Italian interpreter for Mao Zedong. And uh, my father, so as you know, worked with the uh, uh, top Chinese leaders uh, during this period. I will come back, maybe some questions. And this is the last photo I taken with my grandparents, just at the start of uh, at the beginning of Cultural Revolution, 1966. In 1967, both my grandfather and my father were put in jail, and my father uh, stayed there for more than seven years and a half, and mm -hmm. my grandfather passed away six months later. So this is a photo of my mother 
was sent to the Red Angel Kitchen camp for six years in the Hunan province. And this is a photo with the, with the children. All our patients were sent to the same Red Angel Kitchen camp. I'm so happy also to have my friend Qi Yang. Yang is also in this photo. So we spent a few years together in Henan and Shenqiu in this place. This is two photos has a 10 years different. You can see my, this is a um, we took this photo as a witness of reunion after almost eight years separation. When my father was released in 1775. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, so you all you know, so the, the Cultural Revolution ended by the rest of Gang of Four, and Deng Xiaoping launched the reform and the open up policy. And this photo is interesting because uh, this photo is a meeting of Deng Xiaoping with uh, Frank Pinkney, vice chairman of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, it was exactly in this, during this meeting, Deng Xiaoping for the first time talked about uh, whether or not the uh, market economy principle can be applied in socialist country like in China. So. Uh, of course, my destiny changed as um, that of China. I went to university and then go abroad, uh, became a French lawyer for 20 years before I joined Lazar nine years ago. So I just want to end my brief introduction <laughs> by words of my father. When I ask him what he thinks, how he can uh, keep always optimism and hope, after so many suffering and pain. He said the answer to me, he said, Lan, compared to long, long history of China and all the upheavals that have been through, my pain, my suffering count for nothing. Mm. So, wow. thank you mm -hmm. very much. to have you do a little bit of storytelling, Lam, just because, you know, none of us grew up with the background that you had, and I think it would be very interesting to people to hear a little bit about what it was like, what your childhood was like, before we get to the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in such a high-level family, um, you know, you grew up with the likes of Deng Xiaoping and Zhou Enlai and these people. Um, I'm curious if you can, you know, t share some of what that was like. Do you remember the what was Deng Xiaoping like? Did you know him when you were a little, a little girl? Okay, let me share a story with you. Um, you know, in China, well, not so far from Beijing, <coughs> Bei Daihe. Bei Daihe is a summer resort for Chinese leaders. And uh, they uh, go there, still go there, well, uh, for work in the summer hot weather, but also for to get some rest. And in uh, Manly, it's a beach, beautiful beach, and uh, for swimming. So, in 1962, uh, my father has had to go to Bedeke during the summer and to work with Deng Xiaoping and his team, prepare documents. Uh, about uh, Sino-Soviet relationship. And uh, so Deng Xiaoping invited them, uh, uh, told my father, said, let's bring your uh, family uh, to stay at my house. So I went with my mom uh, to Deng Xiaoping's uh, villa uh, uh, to spend a few weeks there. So what is, um, you know, uh, and then uh, so my mom proposed volunteer to to, to, to teach uh, the children uh, English during the summer. My mom never said, I has not, uh, you know, I, I don't want to stay there just for vacation, but uh, do something. So he, she got um, a small class, of course, for, um, you know, Liu Xiaoqi's Xiao daughters, Deng Xiaoping's daughters, and the Chinese daughters. So, so they gather in there for study. And one, so we, we spent, we stayed in, literally in uh, Deng Xiaoping's villa with his children, his family. And um, one night at the dinner time, where everybody was at the wrong table, 
And one certain, my mom said, oh, <laughs> I forgot to laugh, because I did some uh, uh, stupid things, with little stupid things. So she, um, uh, <laughs> she locked me at um, bathroom <laughs> for a whole afternoon. <laughs> I remember the bottom is huge, so the water, <laughs> but indeed, and then, uh, so this uh, so laughed, he said, oh, Madame Wu, you treat your daughter more, you know, uh, as a warlord, so since then, my mother got this uh, nickname, Madame Warlock. <laughs> Deng Xiaoping, in fact, uh, liked very much surrounding by family. He liked, he loved to be surrounded by family. Uh, in particular, during the dinner, the children, the small children, the grandchildren, uh, uh, he liked his family atmosphere, especially for dinner. But he didn't uh, speak too much, and he just like enjoy listening, talking by other people. Interesting. Um, so, again, Lan, to have you continue with your story, you've got the book that, that I think everybody should read. Um, you, I'm fascinated that you chose to almost exclusively write about your family's experience during the Cultural Revolution. Your book is really about that, that era of time, and um, the suffering, and really how terrible it was. Um, first, can you tell a little bit about what happened to your family, what it was like as a little girl, what it felt like to you. Um, and then I want you to tell us a little bit why you chose to write about the Cultural Revolution. Why did you feel, I mean, so much else has happened in your life. Um, and even just now, you know, it's kind of, oh yes, then I became a lawyer and then I became a businesswoman. But, it, which was, of course, a very important part of your life. But you felt somehow, for some reason, that this chapter, was important to write about. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, maybe I talk about why I concentrate this part in my book. In fact, my book also tell my grandparents' story, my father's story during 1950s, 60s with Mao Zedong and the Sino-Soviet Union relationship. But the cultural revolution is, uh, it is an important part of my book because I, it's interesting, I lived in France for more than 10 years, and uh, whenever I tell my story, my experience in the, during the Cultural Revolution, my family story, they all, my friends, were all very astonished about what happened to us, what happened to China. So they said, Lan, you must write down this account of events for us. And then I also realized that young people, the Chinese uh, younger generation, they know very little about Cultural Revolution. Why? Because uh, first of all, in the book, in the education book, at school, they talked very little. And uh, at home, the parents don't want to share their suffering during this period. So I decided to write down because I think it's very important to learn to know the history, to understand and learn from history. So this is the purpose, why I write down as a witness of this uh, horrible period and uh, let the younger generation in particular to know what happened in China. And uh, in order to try to avoid how all the mistakes happened. And uh, for me, the culture movement, when culture movement started, my grandfather was um, um, suspected as um, one of the members of the Northeast anti-revolutionary group. So he was arrested by uh, the Red Guard. So I, I wrote this in my book as a first chapter. Because in my memoir, I always um, remember that night, just before the dinner, the weather came, and they you know, took my grandfather away, and I I'd never see him again. So my father was suspected as a Soviet spy because he was Mao Zedong and all the leaders translator. So what is uh, yeah, uh, you know if they said uh, Liu Shaoqi 
was a Soviet, you know, the traitor. So they have to have uh, someone to communicate with, with the Soviet um, uh, leaders. So it's supposed to be my father. So it's uh, the comic part is um, they took a radio of my home, and um, this radio was suspected to be a tra transmitter for spying activities. After seven years and a half, my father was released, and the conclusion of investigation was this radio was a normal radio. So you see, for only for that, he spent the, his best time, seven years and a half, from uh, 30, age of 36 to um, 40, 44, seven years and a half in prison, in a single confinement. And uh, he didn't, couldn't see any other people uh, but his investigator. So it's, 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 it's the tragedy of cultural revolution. I think it's my family's um, uh, tragedy, but it's also that of millions of people, millions of families' tragedy during this cultural revolution. I should say it's an anti cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. And you had a very um, complicated reaction. You were a little girl, didn't really of course, didn't understand what was happening around you. There's lots of social pressure. Tell us a little bit about how you experienced it. Did you think your parents were bad guys, or did you think they were being mistreated, or how, you know, what, how did you process this experience of seeing them being dragged away and being called the child of counter-revolutionaries? This was very difficult for me. When I, 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 I had my golden childhood with my grandparents, mainly, and with my parents. But when all of a sudden, when cultural revolution started, since me, all my world turned upside down. So I keep always in my mind the image from the Chinese proverbs. Proverb said, Shu dao hu sun san. When the big tree falls, uh, the monkey, monkeys, scattered, <coughs> so monkeys ran away. So all my family members um, either despaired, put in, um, in jail, or sent to the re-education camp. So for me, I couldn't understand. I'm very scared, very scared. So this is my sentiment. And then I, um, you know, at school, at uh, primary school, so I started to have um, a lot of um, you know, humiliation, uh, scorn, so it's really, uh, yeah, I couldn't, it, it's really very, very uh, difficult period for me. And at the time, probably hard not to blame your parents, right? Oh, no, yes, yeah. So the, the professor, I, I still remember very clearly, one day, my teacher asked me to, uh, to, to, to go to, to join her at her office, and. Uh, so she said, uh, you have to confess all the crime committed by your grandfather and your parents. I was so scared and cried. I do not know how to say. But uh, at the bottom of my heart, I said, oh, I, they are innocent. They are not bad people. But why they got such injustice, uh, got such blame? So I couldn't understand. Mm. So, um, Yan, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you experienced. You also lived through that period of time. Yeah, of course. I think that, uh, you know, just Yan and all... Can you hold the mic a little bit closer? I think it's working, but you just have to hold it a little closer. The two of us was just two of millions of families and the kids suffered during that period of time. And for me personally, just like uh, Yanlan, it's just this unprecedented counter-cultural revolution just happened overnight. And uh, none of us were prepared because we were so young, so little. And it just uh, suddenly, it's not just the world turned upside down. It's like the ground crack open just under our feet and we just drop, you know, literally deep, deep in the dark hole without any comprehension of what happened. Mm -hmm. So that is 
as Yunnan said, we were sort of a part of the privileged group. You know, of course, in China at that time, the privilege is, was not measured by material wealth, but by the, the so-called Norman culture uh, hierarchy. And, uh, you know, of course, the uh, Cultural Revolution is trying to break that, you know, hierarchy. But, you know, again, that to put all these loyal people you know, <coughs> behind the bars and without even that give them that, you know, chance to claim their innocence. But uh, for the young kid like uh, Yan Lan and I, we were just completely, I think, what I felt, not just humiliation, it was not just that, uh, you know, embarrassment and, uh, and uh, fear. It's basically, for me deeply, is a being an outcast. Because the China was a conformist society. And at that time, every child who wanted to join Red Guard, they could. I could. They could go to Tiananmen Square. I could. They could be reviewed by the German mob. I could. I'm being a total outcast. And that was a stigma deeply in my heart. It's just not just walking around and seeing my father's name hanging upside down with the big character, you know, paper, and up in the television tower. And his name is with a cross on and upside down for everyone to see. And that is not, but for me, it's not just uh, the, the total incomprehension. It's like, uh, you know, we didn't know how to ask why. But, uh, you know, that stigma, it's just stick on me. You know, and that's it's something that, uh, you know, um, witness everyone else and I'm an outcast. And that is something that always stick. It's, it's interesting that um, a number of books about the Cultural Revolution are coming out now. So uh, there's another big, you know, very successful investor, Shan Wei Tian, who I'm sure you know, mm. who just this past year wrote also a book of which, which is excruciating detail, fascinating detail about his personal experience of going off to the Gobi Desert. And, um, that's, he doesn't draw conclusions, he just describes it, kind of the same way you did, um, Yana. You don't draw conclusions, you just describe. Here's what happened, here's what my experience was. Um, and I'm just interested in hearing you both talk a little bit more about when you think it's important to remember. Why you said a little bit at the beginning, Yanlan, that you feel like we need to learn from history, but can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, is it important to remember the painful past, um, or is it better to just look forward and just keep moving forward? As you know, of course, so many Chinese families, you said, they don't like to share the stories with their children because why burden them with these terrible stories of suffering, right? And, um, you know, but I just want to hear you talk about whether you think it is important to share these stories and why. Yeah. No, I just, uh, I, I think I, I mentioned, I think it's uh, uh, very important because, uh, you know, it, for me it's important to remember. I said, like, um, for the Chinese, for the young Chinese generation, for them to know and to remember <coughs> what happened in China. And for the foreign friends, I think it's to, to know, to learn. Chinese history and to through our personal stories to let them understand better uh, China today. So uh, this is the reason why I think it's um, it's uh, absolutely important to share because uh, in particular a lot of um, parents uh, when I ask my for some my team member in China. And they they were born after 80s, 90s, and even uh, 2000s. So they are young, and they didn't know. 
And uh, so if you don't know how you can remember, how you can learn the, from the history. So this is uh, the purpose. I think uh, uh, once um, President um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, the more you learn from the past, the better prepared you are for the future. I would add that more you learn from Chinese history, the better you understand China today. I think uh, this is uh, our past, you know, this is our country's past. You cannot just simply erase it, you know, like it never happened. It's, uh, you know, someone said that to forget the past means betrayal. That means you betray your own country, your country's conscience. And I think that uh, what happened to that uh, in China in, during the Cultural Revolution, it's, it's really a hard lesson to tell that how could one person, one man, can use his personal power and will and completely destroy a country and destroy millions of families' lives. And that is that is something that should be learned, should be remembered, and should be as a lesson that for generation and generations to remember what happened and what you know should not happen and could be stopped if the system is there to stop it. So that is something that we think. It's very important that you know whether you tell or not tell, you cannot say it never existed, it never happened. So that is something that we think that you know uh, for people like us to tell. For the country, you know, I think going forward that maybe one day uh, this page will be reviewed and uh, relearned of the mistakes, mm -hmm. nothing. And also we want to say that uh, what this cultural revolution's uh, significance to our generation is we have witnessed our parents are really convicted, you know, convict, committed Communist Party members. They were believers in the idea that they are you know, really devoted their lives to, uh, to you know, uh, defeat the Japanese, to build the China. Really, they followed Mao without any question. Right? They just, you know, even you know, put into prison. They were trying to do the self-criticism rather than asking why Mao did that to me. So that is something that, but. What happened to us is that in our very young heart, we no longer believe in that myth, in that idea. And that is something that we learned to question when we were very young. And uh, that is something that uh, you know, we could not believe that someone may say the greatness of a man is you can build you know, a, a, a skyscraper and you can destroy it in your own hand. Is that, it's the edifice that they build of this communist myth is no longer, you know, really believed in this generation or the generation after us. So I think first I just have to thank you both for sharing and being so human and so honest about in your answers. I think it's very profound and deep for all of us. So um, I wanted to push you a little bit more on this to look at today. And this may be a tough question. You may not want to answer it. And if you think it's not, you know, not a good question, that's fine. Um, but you know, obviously today, so much has changed since then uh, in China. People are rich. It feels very free in many, many ways. So much has, has just changed. There's a tremendous amount of freedom. But my question is, do you feel, do you think that there are still some remnants of, in society from those times? Um, and I'll be a little more specific. Some people say that the top-down system 
um, with the top-down system, many people are still afraid to report bad news. And, you know, maybe we have seen some of that in the early days of the coronavirus. I'm sorry to raise such a mm -hmm. sad, sad subject, but when Wuhan authorities, from what we've all read, failed to report what was going on. So I just wonder, are there specific lessons? Is there, are there aspects that still haunt China today, do you think, that somehow linger from, from that era? You know, I think that the remnants, it's a, you know, it's, it's a legacy um, of the system. And uh, it's really, um, I think that uh, um, there are laws of freedom you know, especially with the technology advancement, uh, with uh, all the, uh, you know, 800 million, so probably 1 billion, you know, smartphone users that you can't really stop the information flow. You can't really stop that, uh, you know, uh, getting the truth. So, however, it's, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as the culture, as the Communist Party leader. <coughs> and uh, there's a something that, that they probably have that the discipline, you know, rather than, you know, to, uh, uh, instead of having the information out, they want to consult with it. And, uh, you know, that consultation takes time. Mm -hmm. But it's just something that is not really, the system does not empower the leaders or countries to really hold that because that they should be transparent to people rather than being responsible to your superior. But that is the realm, that is the legacy of the system. You know, after all, it's a still single party state. After all that, the information still is controlled of its flow, uh, even though the society is far more open than before, and uh, the uh, you know uh, public is far more informed than before. But the still, that uh, even with this, uh, you know, uh, like uh, ten years ago, SARS with uh, you know coronavirus in like these days, and uh, it's. It's the fear to get the news out. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, it's not a really uh, purposely try to hide it, but uh, the fear of getting things out wrongly. So uh, that is uh, something is debate. And I think, you know, like, uh, um, I have to say, I was in China during SARS time. And uh, this time that, the things turned a far more faster and more effective and more transparent. And uh, all the measures are coming out of that. It's contingency. And uh, there's no such mechanism within the party and to enable them to do things in time of the crisis. So, uh, you know, it's easy for us to criticize because uh, as a third party, you can see what's wrong. But uh, for them, in the position, it will be very hard. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything? Or? No, it's very complicated. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So before, I'm, we're going to change the subject in a minute to today and, and business and moving on to, to successful um, careers. But I, before we do that, I wanted to ask you both, and particularly since you share with us these emotional experiences and traumas that you have had, through, you know, from an, in your early childhood, just as you said, like millions of other people experience. So yeah. the question is how you reconcile with the past. Um, you know, the same party that caused all that disruption and pain is the same party that's in power today. And I wonder how you kind of, you know, process that and You've both gone on to have tremendously successful careers. You talked about the trauma of being an outsider and being stigmatized mm -hmm. and all that. So how do you turn it around and how do you move forward? Um, after cultural revolution, um, I think the man who uh, criticized my father and uh, you know became 
the uh, head of the Red Guard. Um, he's an American Sydney Rittenberg. Many people may know his name. Um, and he was later on put in prison uh, because of that uh, how could uh, a foreigner capture uh, the uh, country's uh, you know <laughs> voice, you know, uh, being a propaganda head. You know, it's uh, uh, quite at that time was uh, unbelievable. But anyway, he came to knock the door, and uh, my brother wouldn't let him in the door. And uh, he knocked against his lip. You know, he stood there um, at the door. He wouldn't leave, and he continued to knock the door. And I uh, opened the door and I said, "Yo, hey, Uncle Sidney, you know, like a, he said that to me." Like, come to see your father. So uh, um, I got him into the door, and uh, my father and I just said that to me. So uh, they, uh, they, you know, talked behind the door for hours, and he came out completely sobbing, and uh, just couldn't stop sobbing. And then uh, he just, uh, and then my brother still wouldn't uh, just say, why did you talk to this guy? Uh, and uh, he said, uh, life my God, be my God. So uh, that is uh, um, something as maybe it's not just said to his uh, formal rival, mm -hmm. as said uh, to himself. And also, I remember that. It's just that uh, we all have to look forward, mm -hmm. and we all have to go past that, uh, that hurdle. And without doing that, and uh, the country couldn't move, the people couldn't move. So that is something that Deng Xiaoping's uh, greatness is to, you know, let the country be. Just a second. And uh, that is, you know, um, something that so the country can can really lift, you know, um, a leap forward. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Siri is not listening anymore. <laughs> It's really a similar story. So yeah. I think for their generation, it's just uh, we need to move on. And my father also the same. So they're in his you know, translation group in Zhongnan High. Only three persons. My father was head, and there were two members. And one member, it's really, I, I, I also read in my book, it's Mr. Zhu, and uh, he accused, he made a false. Uh, accusation against my father, so this uh, my reason my father was put in, in prison. But um, well, he got out of prison um, and he came to power, so Mr. Zhu came, and uh, my mother was very angry. and said, Oh, you shouldn't talk with Mr. Zhu because he, you know, made you seven years and a half in prison, etc. So my father said, No, let's move on. He had this great sense of forgiveness. I think for their generation, they, I, I cannot see, uh, you know, the, the heat, a uh, heat mm -hmm. in their feeling. Mm -hmm. But they, it's a tremendous um, sense of forgiveness, because for them, the hate, the feeling of hate, cannot produce any positive, uh, you know, uh, things for, uh, to, to, to move on and, uh, stand in the way of human achievement, right? So uh, this is, uh, I think, for their generation and for our generation, we suffered a lot but uh, during our childhood. But what, one thing we want is uh, so draw um, ourselves the strength to change of our destiny. So what we want to do is to change our destiny. So immediately after the revolution, we, we were so lucky to go to school and um, then go abroad, study. But what we want is uh, when we study, when we learn, and we go back to China and make China change. Yeah, I think that uh, it may be 
uh, from the Chinese leadership, and maybe there's a, um, a fear of uh, opening the wound uh, to let the Pandora box open. And after the, uh, the collapse of the Eastern Bloc and Soviet Union, because of all this, uh, like a static file, you know, and also in South Africa, you know, reconciliation, and the people start like doing. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, they should, uh, they always say, you trust people. And I think in this very point, they should trust people, can really bypass and be brave to face the past. And then everyone can have clear conscience, can really feel light at heart. Otherwise, you carry that thing to your you know, grief, and then you won't forgive yourself. You know, that's uh, something that, uh, you know, the Pandora box, uh, it will uh, just like, uh, you know, coronavirus, it will pass, you know, but uh, there is, you know, the period of a crisis, it may be psychological or something, but uh, they really should trust in that uh, people can manage, can briefly face the past, and then can, you know, go past all the dark period and the turn of the red page. So um, we're going to turn to more recent history. Um, and I do want, we're going to leave time for questions from the audience. So please think, start thinking a little bit about what you might want to ask. <coughs> um, but so, okay, so you've both gone on to these incredibly successful professional careers. Um, Lan, you were a lawyer for many years, as you said, and living in Paris, and then back in Beijing. And then you made the leap to investment banking um, and Lazard. And um, yet you were a journalist for many years first. And by the way, we've, we've known each other since the 1980s. I'm delighted to say, yes, a very, very dear old friend. Um, at CNN, and then as an executive at Viacom, and then jumped into a very high level strategic consulting at Brunswick. Um, can you share with us a little bit, sort of what, you know, what do you think, uh, actually, do you think the Cultural Revolution in some ways empowered you to drive yourselves um, you know, harder, and, and how did you find success? And then I'm also curious why you both ended up working for foreign companies, if that was a sort of a conscious decision, or you know, how did that, how, why did that happen? I, I will share an anecdote with you. Because uh, doing, I, I was doing my adult PhD in Geneva, doing a vacation, a vacation, summer vacation, I went back, I said, because uh, uh, my thesis was about uh, international arbitration. So I said, okay, so I went to a Chinese um, uh, institute for arbitration. So I fixed a meeting and uh, I said, oh, I will soon finish my PhD. Uh, what can I do uh, when I have a PhD title? I said, oh, then we will certainly open, um, you know, the opportunity for you and for the uh, students who studied abroad like you. But you have to start at the beginning and as everyone. And uh, let me give you advice. You have to come earlier at office and uh, serve the hot water <laughs> to the <laughs> people. I said, oh my goodness, I spent seven years for my PhD and <laughs> half an hour earlier to serve the hot water for tea for my old colleagues. I said, oh, forget it. It's very good. I noticed okay. so, uh, so this is, I said, okay, I returned to Geneva. I did, uh, did my uh, internship in Paris and they offered me a job, so I joined the French. It's uh, naturally, I joined the French law firm for you know, 20 years. That's a good, very good answer. For, for me, you know, when those were journalists, you know, the, uh, the first and foremost of being a journalist is to speak the truth, to a report, a real story. And uh, to have that as my principle, I would be a cultural unfit for the internal <laughs> system. <laughs> I will be a game and outcast. <laughs> okay, that's another good answer. I will be like a coronavirus. Everyone will try to stay away from <laughs> Okay, so we now want to ask you some of your um, sort of secrets 
and advice that you give. Uh, I'm curious about what advice, especially I know Mayen, you're both really in the, in the business of giving advice, business advice to people. So what sorts of advice do you give to Westerners who are hoping to do business in China? Um, what do you tell them are the secrets of success and what do you think they get wrong most of the time? So, um, the secret, no secret, but uh, when you don't know, I think the most important is to know China, to understand China because of culture, because of the legal system, because of so many different. So, first step, you need to understand China and uh, fix your, you know, strategic uh, um, uh, plan to develop in China. So, the China, I think quite often it's all oh, China. It's a, it's a well, it's a huge market. We can go there for one point four billion clients. In fact, it's not. So you, you, you have to when you think about China. China is not a monolithic, 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 yeah. But it's um, very diversified. So you have to keep in mind diversity of China. China has developed region, Shanghai, Beijing. China was a very poor area like Gansu, Guizhou. China has their own company. China also has a lot of private owned company. So it's a diversified country. Diversified. And also the system. We have a planning economy planning system. On the same time, we have this market economy system. It's called exists. So it's interesting to see so many different things. So when you want to go to China, you have to fix it where I want to put my project, who can be my partner, how can I develop. I remember 20 years ago, I met a friend, came from France and worked with a very big French new company. He said, oh, we start in Guangzhou to make um, uh, yogurt. But uh, I think he's so surprised because uh, in the thoughts, China, the people not eat the yogurt, they drink the yogurt, like a drink. So you see all these details, the difference, make your project, um, you know, viable or failure. failure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, as Yunnan said, I think the secret of our success is because we are a bridge, bridge of two cultures. And we, uh, we, understood, we understand both cultures well, and we know how to communicate, you know, uh, you know uh, to help both sides to understand each other. And uh, as uh, what we also uh, benefit from cultural emotion, I have to, uh, I always say that uh, the bad thing is never all bad. They always have a positive side. It's both side of one coin. And the positive side, what we benefit is that uh, after all these ups and downs, the struggles, the, uh, the life experience, now, we become very strong. You know, it's just uh, that shape our character. And I think that for the young generation, that uh, you should never really worry or afraid to experience different things because everything you uh, go through and you learn is all the way help you grow, help you mature. And I think here that, uh, you know, my daughter is here. I always tell her that it's just like, you know, um, it's not just, you know, we are not a, a born tough, you know, um, but we were became uh, very tough because life, you know, uh, taught us to be tough. Otherwise, we couldn't survive, you know, all the hardships. And uh, to say that we are uh, successful, and it's not an easy success. And we never really take it as granted because that we earn that with our own, you know, uh, efforts. And I think that you know, I want to say, you know, we have uh, many uh, young uh, generation, young uh, people here. I just say that, you know, uh, if you really, you know, uh, try to help China, it's a help to be a bridge 
of two societies, so two cultures and two countries, is very, very difficult, very difficult for us to come today to have such a good bilateral relationship. We want it to continue to develop, to grow, to strengthen, rather than destroy it, you know, in our time. So that is, uh, you know, uh, very grateful that the China Institute gave us this opportunity to, uh, you know, <coughs> to tell our past and to have, but it's, uh, again, China Institute is a great itself. Well, again, I want to thank both of you before we open up to questions. Um, just, I knew when we were sitting having lunch in Beijing, and I knew that we wanted to get Yan Lan to come and talk about her book, and Mei Yan was there, and it just was so clear that the two of you would have a fantastic conversation together and, and um, help us, give us such great perceptive you know, insights on China. So we're very, very lucky to have you. Um, okay, questions, please. I see this gentleman, you were first with your hand up. Can you introduce yourself first? And then, oh, great. Joseph Shu. Um, I actually have two questions, right? And I see you right now. The first one is um, the, um, in the base, your personal experience is very touching. And uh, I think there's a lot of stories, I think, talk about it. It, it was a dark period, that, I mean, uh, not agree. But um, I want to put this in the bigger perspective, right? It seems that uh, <coughs> the cultural revolution, the people, the group that suffered the most, are the elite. So in a way, isn't it just like a factionable you know, internal fight between the Communist Party? You know, essentially, you know, it's almost, I mean, what's wrong with the perspective that are some members of, of the uh, elite Receive that privilege from Mao, and Mao later on took it away, right? So they end up when you work in the Gobi Desert, they're working you know, the, the countryside, they're working in the, the factories. But the majority of Chinese people are, you know, have been living and working there ever since. And they never got the, you know, the privilege to attend college, to go abroad, to do this, this kind of privilege out. So, you know, so my first question is. Um, but let's, add, let's give them a chance to answer that. So, you know, this, so my one question would okay. be, why do you call that period, the Cultural Revolution, the darkest period of, you know, Chinese? Why not Chinese Thank you. Why not 1949? Before that day. Before, you mean before 1949? Or 1949. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Why? Why the Cultural Revolution? Oh, any other. Yeah, because of that, uh, you know, um, uh, <laughs> we don't know anything about it, you know, in our own lifetime, we, we, we were not experienced that the 19th before. And uh, in our period, because of that, deeply in our memory, and that is something of a one leader, powerful leader, can really turn around the you know, country upside down. And I think that because it's a 10 years cultural revolution, it's a long time. It's a many of our parents, the prime time, and the many of my brothers, the prime time of waste for nothing. You know, school, no school, no work. It's the country is, you know, in the deep poverty that because of that, you know, uh, the, the class struggle, the, you know, uh, the Mao say that, that the struggle with the sky, struggle with uh, with uh, earth, you can do, you can do, you can do. That's you know something that does is the life is like uh, you have to fight with everything, and uh, other than feeding yourselves. So you know, and I think that dark in the way is to turn the knowledge to ignorance, uh, turn people to machine, you know, without asking. And that is, you know, something it, it shouldn't happen in the modern time. That in the, for a modern society with the country with, uh, you know, a, a thousand years of civilization, that is total alien to that history. So uh, that we call the dark, and it's, it's really a dark, a savage time. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, 
also <clears throat> you said it's uh, only elite uh, or you know had a very bad time but I should say because more launched this uh, mass um, uh, movement uh, between this revolution but among the mass among the people among even I still remember I went to uh, the villages and to the countryside, so even between the peasants, they were fighting each other because of different positions, etc. And uh, what is the most uh, important is you can see after what well, this 10 years revolution and uh, at the end of these 10 years, the China was really at the brink of bankruptcy. The people all the you know the population we were so poor and uh, the cultural revolution this is what i said is an anti-cultural revolution because uh, 10 years darkness disaster destroyed even more than one thousand years chinese traditional value in china so this is the disaster you know one uh, one person i think that uh, the, uh, let us know. Uh, ask uh, uh, Madame Mao Jiangqing, what is a uh, mass movement? And Madame Mao said, the mass movement is a movement movement. That is uh, basically, is uh, like uh, you just literally mobilize all everyone and to fight against each other. And that is, is something, it's a savage. More questions. I see this woman in the pink. <coughs> um, my name is Sarah Wu. I was also born and raised in China and also lived, uh, studied and worked here for a long time. So thank you very much for the candid personal opinion and sharing of life experience. I've got two questions as well. One, First one, please. <laughs> <laughs> related. Um, is really, what, where do you see China in 50 years time? forward-looking related is also where do you really see China and the U.S. being the two biggest economy in the world? What is their optimal, hopefully, bilateral relationship in that 50 years time? <laughs> you know, that is, uh, you know, um, Oh, please say something positive. <laughs> 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 say in 50 years' time, uh, that is totally different generation. Mm. And it will be a generation born with globalization, the generation born with internet age, the generation born with not much culture difference because of the new technology. So, uh, you, know, at, at, you know, as of now, you know, I think of my daughter uh, who's uh, studied that grown up in China and can tell you that, you know, when she uh, came here for the college, she didn't really feel the gap as what we came <laughs> 30 years ago to study in America, my goodness, Matt, uh, you know, I had my Burger King buy one, get one free. I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> 99 cents. <laughs> I can collect a coupon. <laughs> and that is something that for me, that was, you know, and now if I ask my daughter to go to Burger King and she will, <laughs> so and I think that saying that I say you know generation change is a hope because that they will have no stigma, no remnants, and they have no imprint that we were you know really brought up by, and I really put great hope in the generation change that because. Uh, that is basically knowledge, science, you know, environmental care, you know, all this like a new technology. And uh, uh, the world will be completely different 50 years from now. And I think that, 
you know, what with what uh, this administration of the U.S. Uh, you know, talking of, and uh, then uh, I think a generation will correct it, will really make the world better, and uh, that's my hope. And I really <coughs> want to have a positive note. Here. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so I see this gentleman just on the left here with the yellow tie. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Nina, I'm making you run back and forth. <laughs> okay, of course, my question Can you introduce more, yourself first? Oh, my name is Dwayne Rice Mason. I'm a member of the uh, China Institute. Um, my question is more about international finance. According to the International Monetary Fund, the uh, gross domestic product of China, as measured by purchasing power parity, will be, within four years, will be 56% larger than that of the United States. Do you feel that that will, do you feel that the, the balance of power has shifted from the West to the East? Especially Ms. Uh, Yan, Yan Lam? Um, Yes, yeah, I think uh, it's um, indeed we can see the trend already, right? So today in China, uh, we have um, already 150 million middle class. So, and every year, for, uh, it was said the around 50 million people joined this middle class. So, I think this uh, create tremendous, um, you know. Uh, domestic conception market um, and uh, potential developing China. So you can see the capability. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the grow up in China domestic market in the conception sector, and uh, so um, it's um, um, it's really so every year it's increased a lot. So. Uh, that will have a big impact for the near future on the China market and also uh, for the rest of the world. So I see a lot of investors now come to China and uh, concentrate well to focus in this sector, so the domestic consumption for their you know projects. So this will be a huge opportunity. Another question? <coughs> I see you had your hand up there. Yes. Juliana. Juliana Batista, host of Sub China's Talk for Ta podcast. First of all, thank you so much for being incredible storytellers and being so open. Really want to focus on your careers and just ask you what's a time that you felt the most vulnerable in your career and what did you draw upon to tackle what may at the time seemed like an insurmountable challenge? Okay, I share another story. <laughs> Yes. My story, my yeah. I so um, when I finished my PhD, I joined a French law firm, one of the biggest, one of the oldest, and one of the most international one. So in Paris, and then the very first day, I came to the office and um, I heard a PA speaker said. Um, Monsieur les associés, this means the Mr. Partners. I said, oh, they don't have a Madame les associés, they don't have a female. I said, oh, Lynn, you don't know that. In our law firm, we never have women as partner. I said, oh, my goodness. It's a yes, yeah. So, after six years, generally speaking, six years, seven years, it, it will be <coughs> The time you they have decided whether or not you can be partner or you have to leave to the firm or leave firm. So I fixed meeting with my managing partner. I said, Oh, Mr. Managing Partner, do will I have a chance to become a partner in this firm? He said, None, you work very well, everybody recognizes your competence, <laughs> and we have a lot of female partner, the lawyers, they are all very excellent. But one thing is, as a you know, as a practice, we are law firm. We never have a female partner. Why? He said because you know, as a woman, you get married and then you have children. You have to take care of your husband and your children. I said no. This is my own personal decision. If I can do as well as our male colleagues, 
do I have a chance? And then I was so surprised about your comments because um, I grew up in China. What I learned is a woman holds half her sky. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so after one hour discussion, he said, oh, then you convince me, I will vote for you. So, but in our law firm, so uh, to become a partner, you need at least 75% uh, vote, favorable vote, uh, by the partners. So I went back to Beijing, I remember the partner meeting, and then at midnight, they called me and said, oh, Lan, you get almost 100% vote for the first female partner wow. is a very traditional offer. Wow. So, to say to the young people and to, so you have to fight, right? So you, you have to do, you try your best and then you have to fight to get what you are merit for, what you are deserve for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, what was your toughest moment? You know, um, it's a, you know, CNN is another traditional law firm. CNN has a lot of women, but uh, a woman has to be really tough. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, um, a, like a newspaper print. A TV is a teamwork. So, uh, you know, you go out, you're a woman or not, you have to carry you know, the track out. <laughs> they have to like, carry the, the big, uh, you know, the mouse and you know, and things. So it's always, and uh, you know, it's just uh, really like uh, one uh, I remember in the 89, you know, just uh, on the uh, uh, Berlin Wall, and uh, I was underneath, and uh, then uh, the reporter uh, say, you have to go up there. <laughs> <laughs> to go up there, and I look at what well, I was never a good athlete. <laughs> and it was a really tall wall. <laughs> at that time, you have to really go up there, you know, to, to get things. So I say, okay, you know, I get some guys. I just stand on the shoulder, and boom, that is, you know, I just stood there. You know, it's just a something that. Uh, I never really, you know, I have a four older brothers, so my mother always says it's a mistake. <laughs> because of that, this girl doesn't behave like a girl. You know, I said, because you gave me four older brothers. <laughs> but anyway, so, but even that moment to get on that, uh, you know, uh, bowling wall is a moment of a test. <laughs> Okay, we have to have one more question. Please, I see this lady in back there. Yes. Um, thank you. I hope it's a good question. Uh, I think it is. Um, if, if, can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Paula Thompson. Yeah. Uh, if a version of the Cultural Revolution were to happen again in China, how can you imagine the, what would the reasons be and what might it look like? Which is possible. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I don't think uh, it will happen because uh, back uh, 50 years ago, the, the, the circumstances of this China uh, cultural revolution was China was totally isolated mm -hmm. and uh, the people blindly believe only the China Mao. Today, we lost uh, the same circumstances, no more this uh, environment. So China is connected with the world by the internet, although they have some, you know, uh, control, <laughs> but uh, still, you get the people traveled and uh, the ch students, you know, a lot of the people, you know, a lot of people, movement, students come here and abroad, so it could be never happened as exactly as a cultural revolution, second cultural revolution. I remember Mark Twain said the, the history itself is never repeated, right? Maybe it can be similar, but uh, never repeat. Yeah, I, uh, I cannot uh, agree with uh, Lan more than that. Um, things that happen is because the ground, the environment, the society enabled it. You know, it has a, a fertile ground to let it happen. 
and the one, those elements not there, it will not happen. So, so uh, I would say, even though it may be something similar, but I think that fertile ground is no longer there. So, uh, um, and uh, also I think that people, um, you know, it's, it's more open, I could, you know, I say, you know, China was totally isolated, it was just, you know, like uh, surrounded by the hostile, they say, the, you know, uh, the forces, uh, interest groups, but now, you know, China is very much intertwined, closely connected to the global community, and uh, um, it's not just a Chinese domestic, internally, we don't like things happen. Globally, it will not be, you know, like that happen. So that double forces, I think, will make it very unlikely to reoccur. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask the last question, if I may. But I also want to just make note of the fact that this is kind of a family affair tonight. So you mentioned that your, I see your husband is here, and your cousin, cousin is here, and also Mei Yen's husband and daughter are here. So we're really thrilled to have all you here. But, so my last question for you is, you know, you talked about the two of you being bridges, and you spent so much time in the West, so much time in China, you know both cultures so well. What is the one thing, or few things, that you think Westerners just don't get about China, that you wish the West understood about China. What does the West get wrong? What is it that sort of drives you crazy that you wish Westerners understood? Uh, maybe I just uh, use one word so to give your answer. I thought about the Chinese uh, power. It said, um, it's better to see with your own eyes once than to hear for twenty <laughs> for one hundred hundred times. <laughs> so sometimes I have a bias. You never go to China and then you just read in the media and then you have your own opinion. But in fact it's not totally the whole or diversified aspect of China like I said. So this can contact uh, well, can, can let you have a false or misunderstanding. And uh, so the misunderstanding, based on the misunderstanding, you have a mistrust. So this is most dangerous. So you're okay. saying go and see. Go, go and, and see. see. And uh, yes, I think this is important. Yeah. It's a methodology <coughs> of uh, how you look at China, how you understand China. Yeah, and. and uh you know, I agree with you, Alan. And I think that, uh, you know, statistically, that uh, the U.S. public opinion, uh, negativity toward China has dropped dramatically in the last year. And because I think that the most American public, uh, or uh, probably half of our American people, have never been to China. And uh, they uh, believe in all the sources they gather from newspaper, from podcasts, from uh, social media, is uh, all this kind of uh, uh, bombardment uh, attacking China and completely change their perception about China without actually being in China and uh, see what's going on there. And, uh, you know, interestingly, uh, contrast to that, and if you see that uh, in China, the public opinion's uh, favorability um, toward the U.S. Mm -hmm. has remained very consistent. Mm -hmm. It will not change, even during this kind of a relentless uh, war, uh, you know, trade war in the last two years. Public opinion remained very stable. Why? Because I think for Chinese, uh, once they have a vacation, once they get a passport, they have, uh, you know, extra money, they want to come to the U.S. You know, many people, this is a still the first choice for them to take their first trip. And uh, it's still for many private companies uh, that in China, the leaders still think the first choice of uh, in investment is uh, U.S. because they still believe U.S. There is the growth market. 
So that is something give you the contrast of how the public opinions vary because of not knowing and but believing. And in that way, because we grown up with the brainwash. So you know, we know that effect that you know without knowing, just believing and not seeing things in your own eyes and being there physically to see what has changed, you know, what uh, what China's look like. And uh, that is uh, something, it's a danger. So, uh, you know, I say the best way is that uh, make a friend with Ch a Chinese and uh, then, uh, you know, come to China that uh, you will find it's a very friendly nation, you know, mm -hmm. and the food is good. <laughs> Two things I wanted to remind everybody, and then I'll say thank you again. Don't forget, on your way out, you'll be able to purchase a copy of the book, um, which is going to be, you'll be able to continue the fascinating discussion. And on the back of your chairs, um, I encourage all of you to look at the membership opportunities. If you sign up, you'll be able to get uh, advanced insight into members-only programs, sneak previews. So I encourage all of you to fill that out before you leave. And one more time, I just wanted to say thank you to the three ladies on the stage, especially our two guests.